So, um, hi everyone. So, um, another week, another session of cloud. So, good luck to you. Um, even though we're getting closer to assignment, we realize ourselves how this assignment should have been from the get-go. So, uh, we've yet made another addendum, another change to the assignment. Not critical, it's just a minor extension. And um, because one thing I didn't consider in the specification, what didn't I consider in the specification? Who knows? The assignment. Any intuition? Well, right now I would need to wait 24 hours for you to invoke something and send me a trigger and hopefully it kind of works out or it doesn't. So we obviously want to trigger that for our evaluation purposes and not wait 24 hours until you get feedback whether your system actually works, right? I mean, you may still need to wait, you need to wait 24 hours if there's an asynchronous uh, process running, but uh, not by default. So the idea is there. In addition to the uh, other specifications, it's one more thing we need, uh, but that really shouldn't be a pain because you need that for yourself anyway um, if you write your own, own tests. And this is just the section here that I added. And the idea is there that you can uh, um, um, invoke your web service, so path root evaluation trigger. So it's yet another uh, listener there. And it basically uh, just triggers the notification. So uh, you uh, are supposed to send a notification to all registered webhooks and uh, with the usual payload as specified in uh, earlier above here. So if you invoke um, yeah, if you invoke a registered webhook, that's the kind of payload we are expecting, right? And the idea is there that you just do that based on this invocation of um, this specific path. That's it. Yeah, so um, that's the key idea. And then uh, you just re respond with a reasonable response code. What is that, a status code? What is that likely? What's a good response code for the successful outcome? Okay. Yeah, right, which is in, in, in numbers. Right, yeah, so something like that. So it shouldn't be a, a, a big deal. In fact, it may actually help your own testing uh, using that tool. So that's it. That's the only uh, change, yeah? Cool. Um, who's nervous about the assignment at this stage? Okay, what are the reasons? You haven't, because you haven't started yet, or you have no clue what's going on, or um, along those lines? Mm. Okay, so, but no major roadblock as in, <clears throat> I've never seen Go before, or stuff like that. No, yeah, perhaps. Okay, well, else um, we probably need to carry those questions over into um, the, the, the lab session tomorrow anyway, then. Um, because for the ones that attended, you know, it's, it's just basically exploring further, either continue with the assignment, trying something out, um, um, and, and um, you know, something relates to the lecture, but it's not a particular topic driven um, teaching or anything like that. So, all right, um, looking ahead, uh, now that I can prepare you already. This is of moderate relevance for your, uh, direct relevance for your assignment, so it's not really um, um, uh, something you will need to consider ultimately, but something we'll need to talk about um, now, perhaps for a later assignment, maybe more relevant. And that is the idea of um, infrastructure as a service, right? We didn't talk about this yet. Um, what did we waste most of our time with? Or spend? We want to be a bit more uh, constructive procrastinating procrastinating yeah cool that's that's for the assignment doing but for a lecture bit we didn't procrastinate well perhaps we did who knows but uh what did we deal with yep Pulse. pass yeah cool yeah platform as a service right cool um so i um i got some feedback that most of you guys know the differentiation anyway right from the very beginning we talked about SaaS, pass ias so what's the what's for you the um uh, key features of platform as a service as of now, the way we have discussed it. What are the key features? Yeah? You just push your code to some magic infrastructure that runs and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. So, so you just push and uh, push something to a magic infrastructure, I'm just uh, paraphrasing you, <coughs> and you don't need to worry about anything, right? So, yep. Yeah, also that one key feature is that I always know that once I have pushed it, it will, it will always work Yep. because it's just virtualized. So in 20 years, when the <laughs> platform doesn't exist anymore, yeah. I can still run my software. Right, yeah. 
Cool. So, yep, you delegate your the all responsibilities basically of you, right? So you have your Git repo and you push it, and from then on, their problem, right? Somewhat, roughly. Anyone else? No. Cool. Any, uh, any, any, any. Um, what are the limitations possibly? <coughs> or what are the shortcomings? Um, particular targeting the people that actually. Um, spend time on dealing with Google uh, App Engine. It's very noticeable there, but even for Heroku people, moderately. What are the downsides of using those services, or what's the you know price you pay for using those services in terms of development? Yep. Uh, <coughs> I guess the, uh, you can only do what the platform allows. So if you want to use, uh, I don't know, uh, I don't know if Heroku supports Python, but let's say you wanted to do Python, you can't do that. Yeah, well it does, but you're right. I mean, they may have an exotic programming language and it's simply not supported and then, uh, yeah, that's it, right? So there's nothing you can do from there on. That's very right, yeah, absolutely. What's another the other aspect in terms of uh, getting some something to run there? You guys experienced that hopefully reasonably painless in uh, doing the assignment one. Did you need to, yeah? Share servers with other people? Yes, you share servers with other people. That's a, a shared symptom of this one as well. So infrastructure as a service has that as well. Yep, you share servers with other people. But something about your code. Did you need to change your code to get it running? They have their own web request thingy on GitLab and bit. They didn't use the one that for each of us. Yeah. They have their own yep. thing. Exactly. So, so that, that made it very hard to mock uh, the service. Yeah. <coughs> so exactly that's what I was looking for. I mean, depending on you're kind of forced to buy into the API of that particular service, right? So I mean, yeah, you can't um, access. Uh, you have very limited access to system services. So stuff that uh, is on the computer, yeah. like uh, file system, I suppose. Yeah. So, so that's some one aspect as well, but continuing uh, along those line, uh, this line here, so really customization can be very expensive. If you're thinking about maintaining a generic Go project, for example, assignment one in the long term, and you have a parallel branch for Go, uh, for, for, for uh, the, the Google uh, App Engine, it would be reasonably cumbersome, right? And effortful to actually maintain it. In fact, you would give out either one. However, what's the downside of that? If you just, buy, uh, well, if you just develop for the App Engine, what's the obvious downside? You want to change the platform, you have to change it again. Exactly. So most likely you start, you know, software, uh, straightforward, and you appreciate the performance and all the benefits that you actually get. And you start building on top of it, right, and more and more on top of it, and suddenly your sunk cost, your investment becomes very high in terms of time, right? You really invest it into Google App Engine as opposed to into Go or something that's open source generic or that you can control uh, uh, at your discretion, right? So you're buying into their API. And therefore, at some stage, you won't be able to change anymore because it becomes prohibitively expensive to do that, right? So that's exactly the point. So you need to be very considerate about uh, the long-term perspective, I guess, you know? And you may find that they change the pricing, for example. They may not have the scalability uh, require uh, meet the scalability requirements you have. They may not be available in regions that you want to operate in, right? So from a latency point of view, we'll see that in a second. Um, that's something to consider, yes. But um, even the, what's there? No. Um, but even for Heroku, you needed to do something, right? So, I mean, I was very minor, but um, what did, did you need to do to get it running on Heroku? Your native Go code? Yeah. Heroku supplies you with a port. So you have to yes. Right. You need to assume it to take the port uh, from the environmental variables. So um, that's another point uh, you need to think about. Because it boils down how it's virtualized internally. So, um, and that's, that's another constraint you, you're dealing with those services. Cool. So upside, you don't need to maintain anything effectively, right? You push it and you forget about it. Well, you need to maintain your own code, right? If there's a bug in there, Heroku won't help you or Google uh, App Engine. But uh, as long as you get that uh, straight, you're kind of largely worry-free. Um, the free tiers are quite comfortable as well. So for basic web applications, it's a good solution, uh, generally cheaper than a full infrastructure solution. Um, no licensing issues. Um, so it's a lot of that kind of stuff you don't need to deal with, which is really, really convenient. And 
well, for us now anyway. But um, we also need to look at infrastructure as a service and to get a feel what the differences are to some extent. We will not be looking at it from a um, sys operator's perspective or sys admin or DevOps perspective, um, which would be um, um, obviously the give you a deeper insight, but I think it's more something that should be covered in infrastructure as code in the fifth semester paper somewhat, or in uh, some, some uh, paper of that nature. But right now we're looking more from a developer's perspective, how can we use infrastructure as a service, right? And today I'm just talking about the principles mostly, and then we try to run or connect to OpenStack, uh, the instance that we are running here at NTNU, Sky High, in Jovic in particular, and you should all be able to access it and then we'll see how far we get from there. and. How complicated, how complicated it will be. So um, those are the basic service models, right? Software as a service, everything is, is kind of provided. You interact with this using the web browser or in best case using an API. So it's always API option, obviously. But this would be something like, what's an example for SaaS? Just want to reiterate that. Example for SaaS. Yep, Outlook 365, yeah, Office 365, yeah, if it's running online, yeah, cool, what's another one? I showed you guys one in context with the, when we talked about webhooks, what was there, what was the service we're looking at that time? Sorry? Slack, right, Slack channels, basically also software, you can interact with this without any sort of, you know, API use, but other than user interface or browser or whatever else, an app, but you can also integrate into your flow, right? So basically everything up to application <coughs> level is controlled by the vendor, you just use it. But you need to buy into their API, right? So you need to, uh, if you want to send something uh, um, to a webhook um, of Slack, you need to comply with their specification. There's no way you can change that, right? So pass, bit different. You are actually responsible for uh, the application or services that you provide to some extent. To some extent, probably I should shift up this uh, boundary a bit because some services, as Amisi said, are simply not available uh, as well, depending on the pass platform. But you generally, um, you work on um, service level in the sense that you choose the programming language of your choice, you use, choose the database services of your choice, um, and so on. But you actually don't install and run them, you just use them and hope that they're doing it correctly. Um, what's another concern, since we're on it, um, com in contrast to infrastructure as a service, since, since we're thinking about somebody else is running it, what's another concern that's important to highlight? That we always need to highlight when we talk about uh, programming and cloud computing. Uh, security. Exactly. Right. So you have no clue what those guys are doing. They may be really, uh, you know, kick ass and do, uh, doing a good job and you know uh, managing a system, or it may they might, may just get it wrong, uh, and suddenly your data leaks. Um, you know. So we we saw the recent um, Equifax leak. Right. You guys know observed that somewhere in the news and so on. So you never know who's running your data center and depending on what, what data you're storing there, it may actually affect you um, as well. So an IIS, that's obviously a bit more um, yeah, flaky. So you actually run more. You at least extend to running the operating system as well in many cases. But realistically, um, IIS services generally are past services as well. So oftentimes they provide solutions on top of infrastructure as a service such as a hosted database, such as a uh, um, you know compute engine uh, style of uh, execution mechanism and so on. The, um, the key thing about infrastructure as a service is that you actually can configure um, completely virtualized networks, computing or processing power and deal with storage, right? So you can set up your own dedicated database um, or uh, link um, the different components. So um, mount individual volumes into instances, so uh, VMs, for example, and configure relatively complicated networks. We'll see how that uh, goes in practice uh, later looking at this. So that's the idea, right? So how much is managed by the vendor or provided by the vendor? To some extent, you need to still manage it or configure it using environment variables. In pass, you can configure sometimes wh via the GUI, some characteristics, runtime characteristics. In IAS, you're pretty much configuring all of those to some extent. For example, you choose the kind of processing power you want you choose the kind of storage you want to be dealing with or the kind of uh, networking um, you have. So, um, Michael showed that earlier this semester, it's an updated one here, but it's basically for us moving increasingly from a, um, well, from a, from a platform services perspective, I guess that's, that's probably the way to put it. Uh, we didn't really touch software services on the high level, they're really domain specific and software we, yeah, we touched on MongoDB, that's an example here, so database services. Um, 
this would be really the pass level where we have individual services that we can use and that are provided. Um, then they are uh, integrated using more generic platforms such as Google App Engine um, and other ones, Azure uh, services, for example. And then now we're really moving to this direction where it's really about the infrastructure, the baseline infrastructure. No need to really read it. The idea is more to look at the headers here. They give you an intuition of what's happening. Generally, infrastructure services deal with storage, computing, so processing, and oftentimes service management. Again, something was highlighted before that's not really happening on, on Heroku, right? So you need to actually, or now you can actually do your server monitoring yourself. That's the key, key idea I want to uh, get across here. So not that we go into any depth in that. Cool, um, just to summarize the um, differences as far as uh, I think we uh, discussed them to some extent. So pass um, generally focus on the application level service. This is kind of the worry-free operation style. So you just deploy and forget about it, hopefully. Well, you rely on the vendor's uh, goodwill, but you do it in the other case anyway as well. So IAS is generally a mix of uh, platform as a service and plus infrastructure. And, but you literally have access to the raw resources to a considerable extent. Uh, in fact, sometimes to a stronger extent uh, compared to your own data center, because simply you have so much more power at your hand. Um, yeah, and you can basically extend it and build on it and build your own uh, structure, including hardware system architecture as well as you know software solutions on top of this. So those are the obvious uh, challenges. We talked about um, the obvious problems, which are generally security, um, and for the IAS case, uh, it's obviously also obligations because now you yourself need to think about security, and we will feel this. Um, quite immediately today, for example, um, you need to be much more uh, careful about this, especially since it's now really public on the internet, right? So in most cases, you will have an environment that is uh, publicly available in principle, so you need to control it to some um, extent. Cool. So um, actually, the, but the question is, PASS is actually doing quite well. Are there any other reasons why we probably need to learn and know about IAS? IAS. IAS. How do you pronounce that, actually? How would you guys pronounce that? Yes. Yes, okay, works IS. for me. I, I, yes, yes, probably. Yes. Pass, I, yes, yes. Yeah, um, I think it's a strong linguistic component there. Um, so, what would be other reasons for really dealing with IS or ES or whoever S? We have more control and so on. So why do you guys, you guys need to learn about IS? Why don't you just learn Go and we go from there? Any guesses? No. Volunteers? I sense some intuition. So no, I think it's also for you guys also important always to look at, uh, at the market to some extent. And um, obviously there are multiple uh, um, you know, research firms, consulting firms that look at different principles. But the idea is here that looking at all three um, aspects of uh, or as a service flavors, uh, infrastructure, software, and, and the platform, we'll find that uh, the expected growth rates, particular for infrastructure service, are have the strongest will have the strongest growth in the next uh, few years. So that's the anticipated growth, roughly. Whereas platform services probably stay in that you know lower range and actually don't have as much growth. Any intuition why this could be the case? That's a prediction by a um, 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 market research firm. Any idea why this could be the case? Or any any explanation for any of those curves? In fact. Oh, yes. Maybe cheaper, perhaps. Like mm -hmm. bigger companies, they have the resources to do the yeah the things, and they don't need like App Engine to take care of much of their stuff. Yeah, they cool. Can do it in house. You're right. They do. You're, you're kind of right. So why why explore on this idea? So why why did I say make a difference? So you said in house and they don't. Yeah, they can make more customized uh, yeah. management tools. To right. Uh, yeah, suit more their needs. Yeah. And the uh, more generic management from European. Yeah. Cool. So they, yep, that's part of one. Yep. So we have better management, basically, of the services. No need to bind to those probably 
less customized solutions, right? So that uh, past platforms have. What's another concern, possibly? Yep. Uh, well, I don't know the concern, but then it does seem like a transition phase. Yep. So it's more like uh, <coughs> uh, because the, uh, many businesses have their own data centers now, they may want to change, or the new companies may want to adapt to this uh, new model. But uh, ultimately, that will slow down, and then uh, as uh, we get more and more PaaS and SaaS, then I would imagine they will probably uh, come back and like become more important again uh, compared to yes. You mean PaaS services? Yeah, PaaS and uh, SaaS combined would uh, they would grow eventually because now we're in a transition phase. Yeah. Uh, but when the transition phase is over and uh, it has kind of become the standard, yeah. then the growth would be fast and uh, south, I would think. So I get it, if I get it right, you're suggesting that companies go into sa in IIS right now, infrastructure as a service. Mm. Why do they do that? Because of the transition phase, because now it's becoming more and more available. So and many people who are lagging behind, many companies. Yeah, but why don't they use SaaS services or PaaS services? Because they uh, want control over what the products they develop. Yeah, that's part of one. Yep. Yeah, maybe they are the, like conservative. They they want to take a like a it's a easier step for them. Yep. Okay. Because they uh, yeah like they, c they still have control over a lot of the stack. Yeah. So it's just the lowest part they shape. Of yep. The lowest part of the stack. So mm -hmm. it's um, a smaller step for them, smaller mm. transition. Most importantly, they uh, have adaptability because uh, uh, PaaS and uh, SaaS, they may uh, require you to uh, you know, stick to some, um, some, so, some part of the, the limits of the solution that you're using. Mm. Whereas uh, with uh, EOS, you can uh, adapt to, because companies always need to adapt. That's, like, that's how the market works continually adapting and then you need to have freedom you need to have uh, that's one to, uh, adapt. yeah but but coming back to that's that's good that's good but i'm um, coming back to your initial point you're saying they're shifting right what are they shifting to uh, cloud services what are existing companies shifting to cloud services legacy code yeah and what's the problem with that uh, you can't run it on pass because it seems like foreign to them so you need to rewrite the, the entire monolith or whatever they had, right? So you have one big, old, clunky, non-scalable application and you want to get going somehow cloudifying it, you know? So you kind of want to put it somewhere in the cloud, but you don't want to deal with this, you know, disrupting it, taking it apart and basically effectively redeveloping in a past environment, right? Because you need to buy into their solutions and you need to start from scratch. What's the difference in IAS environment? Uh, then you can just do everything yourself so you can uh, sort of virtualize the environment that the legacy code was meant for. Exactly. So whatever you run on a you know bare metal server or already on a VM, just put in a cloud service and then run it there. So you basically just switch on, you know, shift the VM, switch it back on, everything should work. No need to buy into customized APIs, um, um, you know, beyond a certain point, at least not on that application level. So you can just run your stuff in the cloud directly. So um, you, you're spot on. It's really about a transition phase here. And you, you're probably also right that it may actually, uh, um, um, you know, um, eventually stop. Um, this, this trend may actually uh, change over time. But for now, just putting things into the cloud is super easy to put in IIS. Uh, relatively straightforward, so the shift is really relatively cheap because redevelopment is the expensive bit. Deployment shouldn't be too expensive, especially once it's in the cloud. It will just become cheaper because at that stage you have virtualized everything already anyway, uh, if you haven't done that before. So it's kind of works on the lower level of uh, of, of um, system uh, management. Uh, what's the price difference between uh, the uh, those two IIS and uh, PAS? The it's 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 hard to um, I think it's very hard to 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 capture that um, because it's really when you think past you really think more per application level and IIS you think more like per server level which is like a vastly uh, a, you know it's a very different concept right so because you're not constrained to a single application so um, I struggle with the direct comparison in terms of in terms of pricing right so the per instance. Runtime. If you have one single application uh, and you can afford the customization, 
uh, paths will, the way to, will be the way to go. But if you have extensive scalability needs suddenly, then it may at some stage be cheaper just to spin up a machine and constantly run it on AWS or uh, Google computing and so on. But um, yeah, so, but again, that's a very dynamic element uh, on the market. In, in AWS, there's the concept of, uh, what is it called? Um, spot instances so where you can actually say well i'm running a new instance but only if the price is like that so you're actually uh dealing with their uh, free capacity and they will spin up the server if the um they have sufficient free capacity to offer the um computing or processing time as a very low price or a price you actually set so you can twist around the game to some extent that's another new um, um market that's currently emerging but it's really hard as for now i would say to compare both um, those perspectives but um yeah let's we'll see cool all right um so infrastructure as a service so what do we have um generally you have very fine grade control and the key things that uh, you guys all have highlighted uh, or many of you have highlighted is really about dealing with computing on the one hand generally vms or container services. We'll hopefully get to uh, talk about container services tomorrow. Um, storage. So um, storage and computing is not the same thing. So we, we can use storage without computing or in combination. Um, so um, and, and you, you can customize it to your needs. Uh, in some cases, you may actually not need any sort of uh, virtual machine that you are using in your system, but just rely on um, the, the, the data services provided like S3 and so on, you can directly write and read from them, but actually not using their computing capability. Yep. There's one thing I'm wondering about scaling. Yeah. So uh, you have a virtual machine, but the virtual machine is a kind of, does it kind of live on multiple other machines simultaneously? Or do you have to actually configure each and every, like, uh, I don't know, well, the virtual, virtual, virtual machine can, uh, if you need like uh, 10 big cabinets of yeah. computing power, yeah. do you need to configure it on every each and every one's uh, computer or uh, when you kind of work with ES or do you have to, uh, or would you just do it on one virtual machine and it kind of spreads uh, by itself? Cool. So there's, if you want to go on that route, that's a bit more operations kind of stock, but, but sure. Um, so there's two ways you can do it. Number one, um, that's the neat part about virtualization. You create a fully set up uh, uh, machine, virtual machine that you, that's the way I want it kind of, right? Plus bells and whistles for customization, like name and stuff. But you basically say, well, k take a snapshot of that instance and then create a 10 instances of that. So you can, that's the answer number one. You can easily roll out, you know, 100 or 500 instances or probably, you know, I don't know. I'm not sure what the limit is, but uh, you'll be easy to get your 500 or 1,000 or perhaps even a million instances, uh, depending if, if you want to pay. So you really have full power at your avail. So that's number one. Number two is um, what's called the software configuration management approach, where you have one central service, server that provides um, configuration information. So it... Um, um, there's also a term of uh, desired state management. So the idea is that every computer should have a desire or server should have a desired state. And they all simply contact that master computer that is configured and has the configuration and then all install autonomously uh, whatever the uh, master prescribes them to install, right? Software packages. For example, you need to install the following software packages uh, up to version so and so and so on. So you just configure it on one machine. And as soon as those machines start, they contact the um, server, the master, and then they do it themselves. So it's a slightly different approach, right? One of them is to take an image, just copy the image. Mm -hmm. The other one is actually having a proper uh, uh, service model where the clients regularly pull with the server and um, uh, follow up with deployment. For anyone who did the fifth year, fifth semester, sorry, a course that, what is the software they're using there? Who did infrastructure as code? No one? They use Puppet there, yeah? So it's the software they're using and it's precisely for that purpose. Uh, but it's independent whether it's virtualized or not that works everywhere but particular to the virtual environment is the copying approach or snapshotting approach yeah, uh, I'm just wondering whether if I as a user yep. uh, would have to actually uh, do a lot of manual labor or whether it is kind of just do it on one thing and then you, then it kind of scales by itself um, it, well scale is a slightly different 
problem in a way. So you probably also need to have a, a load based. Um, so how it would work in practice is you have your um, um, cloud center is measuring the load, the number of requests you're getting from a load balancer. And once the, this exceeds a certain threshold, it spins up new virtual machines. So it's basically the whole infrastructure would look, if you set it up this way, obviously, not in the default case that we are exercising. So you have your, let's say, a few VMs, right? Those are all instances, yeah? So that are running there. And in front of it, they're sitting one or, you know, done possibly a load balancer. And this gets requests on your IP address, right? So, and once, by default, one or two instances will be running. But if the uh, request exceeds a certain uh, amount, then it will just dynamically spin up further instances, yeah? Mm -hmm. So you obviously, what's the important thing if you think about this? Spinning up of instances. What's an important aspect that needs to be considered? Price. Of course, price. Very central aspect. Yeah. What else? What else is another problem? If you think from a uh, now developer architectural point of view, what's another problem we need to think about? Creating an instance of the same thing. So concurrency. Concurrency. Yeah. Exactly. So how is that reflected? What's the problem there? Really you have to create the software so it can uh, is independent of how many users and how many servers there are. Yeah. Yeah. So fundamentally, it's about separating processing from storage, right? So so you you kind of have a by whatever means you know shared shared data store that all of those obviously access for their services, right? So you scale on computing, scaling this one is a lot harder. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. That's why we have no SQL databases to think about this issue, particularly for reading. No SQL databases are fairly fast, but uh, there are different, different schemes here on thinking about redundancy on database level. But this is one of the challenges, but price obviously another one um, to, to be discussed. But this is the advanced configuration. We're not going too deep into this one because, again, that's too much ops uh, already. Um, I actually would be keen doing that, but I think it's going beyond the, the purpose of that course uh, for now. I, shall discuss that further. But that's the intuition here. So the idea is that you give the system the rules, right? The threshold and rules for spinning up, define the images you want to start and so on. The system deals with this and also shuts them down. So you wait for, uh, you know, um, 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 going uh, if que requests go below a certain threshold, for example, then the system starts shutting down particular instances. So reroutes every traffic to the, uh, you know, a subset of them and the remaining ones are shut down and so on. But it's also more advanced things, uh, systems that can capture seasonal cycles. So they can actually preempt or predict uh, when you have a, you know, high um, or daytime cycles, when you have high demand. For example, you know, possibly doing evenings after work, right? Or at lunchtime or uh, around Christmas season or, you know, those, those kind of uh, patterns are then increasingly interesting as well. The good part about it is that this whole thing, especially in the advanced cloud services, is fairly uh, fairly strictly monitored so you actually have a very good analytical overview of how your system is used because it's fully virtualized right so you don't need to have a physical means of monitoring or driver monitoring every device it's just done by the infrastructure itself they know exactly they are uh, they can charge you based on request level literally yeah so you'll be able to um, and that's exactly what amazon is increasingly doing they are uh, uh, charging per sub-second uh, processing power. So you're actually really only paying for what you need. Yeah? So if you don't need infrastructure, then you don't pay. So a lot of those, those schemes come up and that will be quite interesting in the market. So the point is what I want to get here is to appreciate the complexity that's below whatever you as a developer need to provide in the first place. But you will need to think about certain strategies of separating, for example, processing from data, right? Or to ensure that this uh, system can deal with concurrency or scalable, right? So that's the key, that's the key aspect to, uh, to um, deal with. Okay, cool. Um, but in addition, obviously, to uh, scalability, computing, um, storage, we also need to deal to some extent with networking so, uh, and monitoring. So that's, again, software configuration management, by the way, is precisely what you asked me before. That's like the puppet for uh, rolling out, uh, deploying automated uh, services, right? And monitoring, obviously, something as well. So the management becomes uh, of increasing um, importance. So some of the aspects. Um, cool. So uh, in reality, however, if you look at the uh, portfolio that those services have, 
most of them are actually technically path services, I would say. But the neat bit is they're neatly integrated, so you can actually construct a fully fledged application using all the individual services, meaning you're buying into the APIs, but you also have the choice of running your own <coughs> machine, your dedicated uh, container, for example. But uh, we'll, um, we'll uh, see that uh, later. I think uh, tomorrow, I'm not sure if we have the time today, tomorrow I'll probably briefly run through AWS. Ah, yeah, on that note, um, I'm uh, currently still um, trying to figure out, uh, no, actually trying to get um, um, access um, for you to AWS, so kind of get some free computing time and so on. However, you can get it yourself as well, but I wanted to ask something in the first place. So, as a, we don't really need access to AWS, but I believe it's quite useful for you to have exposure and see what's possible in the system. Downside is, as soon as you sign up, guess what they ask for? ask you for first what's the first thing they ask you for well, actually the second or third thing anyone credit card, C credit card number right exactly so and I'm inherently I'm opposing those <laughs> uh, uh, means and ways so um, so it's up to you I will not uh, not require you to sign up in AWS because I'm not sure if uh, uh, that's that's a yeah do you know DigitalOcean yes is that the same Yes, uh, DigitalOcean is, is an alternative, but DigitalOcean is way simpler, right? So, but also realistically, in many respects, DigitalOcean is really nice to use. But um, <coughs> if you want to use it for your projects, it's, it's a good way of doing that. I agree. Um, features are really nice, but it's fairly close to what we have in OpenStack. So we will we'll play hopefully later with OpenStack a bit. And if you use DigitalOcean, you have many of those features there as well. Yeah. So DigitalOcean, there are various set of further vendors uh, like this. Um, so yeah, something to be. Um, I used that before, so it's very very nice. But you hit boundaries eventually. So and then you want to see the big uh, picture. I'm just pointing at AWS because it's relatively important um, uh, on on a um, from a market point of view. And we get to that uh, in a second. Um, so I leave it up to you. Um, but if you want, um, it's probably worthwhile signing up, and uh, you get a year's free of free tier. Usage, so you can actually use, uh, you know, containers and stuff and so on for uh, for free for a year, and I hope still to get some uh, voucher, educate voucher, so you should get a bit more, um, uh, you know, give you a certain amount of US dollars for free, basically just to explore their services. Yeah, so I leave it up to you, and I'll come back to you once we get there. But I will show you some AWS features uh, possibly tomorrow, uh, just to get a feel what's happening there. Yeah, so to give an intuition. Okay. Um, we're still on terminology before we uh, get to something hopefully more practical. Um, and that is the uh, idea of private, public and hybrid cloud. And um, did you guys hear about this before? Did we talk about this before? <laughs> yes, no, perhaps, anyone? Yeah, so what's the, okay, so what's the key features of private, public? When to use what and on why to use what? Oh, public is uh, like, a common for a, for a normal use when you don't need to and somehow you don't know where it is stored and you don't have a possibility to, to require that it's gonna to be kicked uh, away from the data from the other users yeah and it's uh, obviously cheaper than the private cloud that you can somehow require that this is the this is the cloud for uh, for me only mm. or for my company yeah that we are using this um, uh, you know, dedicated uh, dedicated place just just for us and i favor this uh, kind of the mixture of those two that you probably could uh, uh, share the, the cloud with uh, or parts of it with uh, with uh, corporates yep. like another uh, company that's uh, that's delivery or or yeah or maintain uh, the logistics uh, chain yeah that can use this this cloud uh, it, would be, it would be not possible in the private cloud because then they would have access to everything right cool so th yeah you i think you delimited the constraints uh, entirely it's basically pretty much about business decisions, right, management, uh, but it's also about regulation, right? So um, there may be regulatory requirements that, you know, don't allow you to 
uh, have data, you know, in, in a multi-tenant environment. So we actually really, really don't know where your stuff is stored, right? So which exact server right now? Whereas in a private uh, case, you actually have a dedicated, you know, physical um, 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 physical hardware somewhere that is yes virtualizes something on top of it, but you know where it is, and someone is responsible. Either you're running it yourself, or you have a service provider that does it for you, but at a given given, given uh, location with service level agreements and 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 so on. So um, strict privacy um, considerations, possibly more expensive, um, ag agreeable. Um, in terms of using the hybrid cloud, what is a good? What would be a reasonable separation? Uh, you know, why would you use a? Can can you think about business scenarios uh, or no parts of business applications that would run in a private and one some that would run in a public cloud service? So if I have, for example, uh, uh, part of the data that uh, that are personal files for the for the employees, yeah, and the part of the logistic delivery system that uh, that should be have some kind of interface or database uh, allowed for uh, for or uh, providers uh, deliver delivery or to to sales to the yeah. customer if you have the uh, some kind of outsourcing of uh, you don't sell it yourself but you just uh, send the the things uh, you are producing to the other mm. to the shops for example yeah then the shop could have uh, some kind of the common them data with you mm. but you don't want to share uh, your production uh, uh, yeah secrets yeah exactly so it's often about business secrets to some extent but another thing i could think about in terms of scalability um for example if you have a um, you know your company your services uh, which run in a private cloud but you have customer facing services such as a web shop and so on and what is characteristics of those ones coming back to what we just talked about where do we most likely have scalability challenges in the internal application software of a company or customer facing or uh, b2b or wh where's the where where do we need to with deal with scalability the most, most likely. Sitting on the tip of your tongue? No? Yes. Yep. Probably the, the bottleneck is this uh, when it's coming from this public part to the to the private. Yeah. Because uh, I suppose that uh, the all this uh, infrastructure then follows the, the somehow the possibility to, to, to produce to, to, to send yeah. um, uh, goods, but. Uh, so this probably is not uh, it's not going to change uh, yeah. uh, very much in the court in the short time. Mm. But uh, the amount of requests and um, where uh, customers are placed around the world it probably could uh, could uh, could give some problems exactly. at least more on this yeah. side and uh, on the inside. That's right. So that's generally the the perceived perspective. So customer facing is the key thing that needs to scale. Markets can change, right? You want to open up to a new market. You have seasonal business suddenly, right? So, and the production logistics side that can still be asynchronous, right? So it doesn't need to be in real time response, right? So you, you, you queue it up and actually work it off. But having a website and you actually press the buy button, you better get a reasonable real time response to the customer to confirm that he or she was actually successful in buying their product, right? So that's where scalability is super important. And that gives a lot of opportunities here for using a mixed uh, setup where you just have basically a web shop, you receive basically uh, orders and then you queue them and send them to the private cloud environment to further processing and so on. So you maintain all the regulati regulatory requirements, hopefully, and uh, keep business secrets, business secrets. So, yep, cool. So that's the key idea, just to be aware of what is, what, 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 what are the different characteristics in terms of somebody, uh, in case somebody talks about it or some uh, exam asks you for it. Um, so um, so the big three on the market, uh, AWS, um, is yeah, 
um, certainly the oldest one, starting in 2006. They are incrementally introduced more and more services. I think they have now 60 or more services that they offer uh, that you can use if you sign up to Amazon Web Services, which is quite of exp is extensive. Then Azure, Microsoft, um, they announced it, I think, in 2008, and then 2010, they are, um, yeah, I think it was called Windows Azure in the, in the, in the beginning, but they realized that it's not really an end-user project as such, but rather more like a um, platform comprehensively. Um, so um, that launched in 2010, so they have a massive amount of services, and um, Google Cloud Platform followed in uh, 2011. So, um, so those are the key big players on the market right now. Um, Amazon is by far the most um, experienced one in a, in a way um, because of its legacy, right? So having uh, four years ahead of anyone else um, makes a huge difference. Secondly, they have a good uh, test scenario for actually using their environments, their own bookstore, literally, or products, their own market, right? So they're running their own services on AWS, which is basically the result uh, anyway. So uh, they wanted to run their own infrastructure and then leased out or, you know, made this infrastructure uh, uh, accessible without actually relying on the, you know, Amazon um, 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 web shop kind of facilities and so on, which you can use as well, but um, different problems. So they're sitting uh, way be below this. So they have extensive documentation. They have global presence in 44 different, let's say, call them zones, which is considerable, um, um, relatively worldwide um, spread, just to give a feel where they are, where they are uh, available. Um, actually quite Impressive. So, um, so that's their global network, for example, right now. So, and you largely many regions are covered. So, the obvious ones that are not covered are uh, Russia right now and uh, particular Africa, which are still. But Microsoft wants to go into that market, so that will change soon. Um, so, yeah. So that's that's Amazon Web Services. They are um, relatively widely um, um, available. Azure is a bit bit smaller, 36 zone and, uh, and cloud platform as well. So market distribution. So yeah, you have a question. Uh, what is the ne neutrality of these services? I'm, I'm thinking uh, 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 particularly Microsoft Azure. Yeah. Uh, I'm a little skeptical whether they uh, might uh, want to uh, enforce Microsoft stuff. Okay, right. Uh, yep. Yep, cool. Um, very, very, very. <coughs> Yep, very, very valid point. Um, so yeah, the, the, the Amici is um, voicing the concern that um, different vendors may actually push their own product line, especially if they are native IT vendors, like online Amazon, right? Which is more like from a different domain, right? So they didn't really, weren't really known for producing operating systems or the like, but then. Um, so um, the answer is no, they're fairly, they are really open. So uh, you can run Linux instances on Microsoft Azure. They opened it up a few years ago because they had that issue as well. They're realizing nobody's using Azure if there's only Windows products running or you know, Microsoft Windows Server products running because in the end, uh, uh, we know that most servers are uh, run in Linux. So Microsoft is, uh, the fact that it's Microsoft doesn't uh, constrain, uh, doesn't represent any sort of worry in a sense that uh, you can only run Microsoft products at all, in fact. But what it, uh, for all services, uh, one thing to bear in mind, if you use um, their specific, you know, um, database storage um, solutions, for example, I had an example here. If you look for AWS, they have various databases uh, and they have an own database, the house kind of, uh, uh, um, you know, um, um, you know, individual uh, s proprietary, if you want, database services, AWS relational database services, which may, um, I'm not sure about this one here right now, but I think it has compatible interfaces to database services, you know, but still you're buying into their particular solution in that particular case, right? And this is the case uh, for all of those uh, cloud providers. They all have services that are particular to them and need to buy into their idea. The only thing that's really generic is uh, running a full container, for example. They generally rely on on uh, Docker, uh, but even there, have sometimes have a house-made um, solution. So all those things in parentheses here are basically specific solutions of a particular vendor. But looking at operating systems, I think that um, story is told. There is no longer any issue of running particular operating systems in any of those clouds. Um, that's, but it's a very valid concern, 
I agree. Any guesses with respect to market distribution? Azure does most poorly. Azure does most poorly. Okay. Any any anything harder than that? Any guesses? Ninety five five. Ninety five five. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Okay. Uh, be, bear in mind there are other players as well. They're just smaller than uh, all the three ones. Yeah. So. Five four. <laughs> okay. Okay. Anyone else? It's, actually, it's probably not as daunting, but yeah. Seventy, ten, fifteen. Seventy, ten, fifteen. 70, 10, 50. So you said ninety. What was it? Ninety, ninety-five, four, right? Was it? Yeah. Cool. All right. Other guesses. Sixty-four. I don't know. Again, sorry. Sixty-four thousand. Sixty percent Amazon. Yeah. Okay. Ten and thirty. Okay. Cool. Sweet. All right. Um. Yep. That's anything. One final guess. No. Yeah. Cool. Try that. That's already wild guessing there. Uh, we'll see who's who's closest. Uh, with the most of the crowd. Well, the current distribution actually looks like uh, that. So. Um, the other, uh, so the contributors that are really unnamed because they are so minuscule uh, in the distribution still make up 20%, so there's still space in the market. Um, but Amazon leads with about 40%, so 41%, uh, clearly the leader. But you, I'm not sure, I, I was actually surprised how small Google Cloud is, 3%. Yeah? So Azure has 30%, so they have caught up considerably, which is uh, interesting uh, in terms of... Um, um, it, you know, con contrary to the expectations. So, so uh, this is measured by bucks, dollars. No, this is by workload. workload. Yeah. So uh, um, there's returns. I didn't look at the returns. Yeah, that's good. that's different. But because that's more reflected, uh, reflects more the pricing, right? Yeah. Than it does, in my view, the use to some extent. Yeah, but, but, but the thing is that uh, I just imagine that uh, uh, stuff uh, like, like uh, Microsoft they. Um, they, they're very, uh, they're very on the offense when uh, uh, when they do uh, like uh, sales. Yeah. While uh, Google is kind of yeah, it's kind of a spoiled brat because they are so fucking big. Yeah. And, like uh, they are everywhere and like, that's right. Uh, so I just imagine that uh, Microsoft have been like very trying mm. to get the customers to right. send yeah. physical people mm. to go visit companies and like this is what we exactly. offer you. So. Again, coming back, why is that? Why were they likely so successful? Why were they relatively successful? Why do you guess they were uh, had, had that success? Because, because they waged war. But yeah, that is was part of it. But coming back to the earlier consideration, was here wh why? What's what's the current? What was the situation before? That's usually something that usually gives a good insight. Because they were first. They uh, first in what sense? Right. Um, I'm thinking more along the lines. Think about the companies themselves before clouds were there. What did they run, most likely? I would say that most of them should run Linux on this sort of thing. But uh, if they run Windows, then it makes sense that many would. Like exactly. Microsoft. That's exactly what they what what happened. So uh, many that ran Windows infrastructure, but wanted to do the cloud thing, but had no clue about AWS, something else. There's, I think there's a certain trust element if you read Microsoft in there, and you know it's the same kind of club, so you're much more inclined to just follow. Uh, yep, and that yeah, and instant. Also, when you get a pop up in Visual Studio with the Azure, <laughs> yes, there that's are so many like ah, uh, we just click here, and yeah, you get Azure. That that's right, that's right. So they integrated well. That's a good point. I didn't uh, think about this. You're right. There's a st strong integration with any sort of service. Uh, that makes it a lot easier. You're absolutely right. Yep, that's right. Uh, Let me see. Last thing is that uh, Microsoft has um, always had like a foot inside the door, exactly. uh, and they had for many years. They were like the uh, they were on every government computer, uh, mm -hmm. government uh, governments uh, which are the biggest organizations in, uh, usually in most yep. countries, 
uh, they use uh, Word, they use uh, uh, PowerPoint, they use uh, op uh, Microsoft operating yep. system. That's right. Which is called Windows. I just forgot what it was called. And, uh, <laughs> and, and all, through all these, all this kind of stuff. They've always been using it, and they continue to use it. Yeah. And because of that, it just seems like the most yeah. natural uh, yeah. uh, partner uh, is uh, Azure instead of uh, Amazon. Yeah. Instance. Yeah. So no, no, that's absolutely right. Particularly, also Active Directory is one strong one, right? The thing. Um, um, that, that governs most uh, domain authentication. Anyway, cool. Um, so I think uh, we take a break here because before we briefly dig into OpenStack. Um, 10 minutes, 25 past one, okay. <laughs> or do you need less, more? <laughs> the response is overwhelming. Okay, let's make it 25 past one then, okay. <laughs>